So we are in station 34. We are almost heading to the last uh, stages of the development now. So we will cover the WCF in this session. Uh, so we'll see a lot of uh, topics like Windows Communication Foundation overview. What is it? And implementing an employee service, we will see a code walkthrough of our WCF service. How can we create them and consume them uh, in certain other applications? And also we'll see deploying and consuming the employee service using WCF. And a lot of, lot of other uh, interesting features about uh, WCF. And this is going to be a very productive session uh, of, on WCF. Okay, let's kick off session 34. Okay, so this is about the Windows Communication Foundation, WCF. So the WCF is a framework for building service-oriented applications using WCF. You can send data as a synchronous messages from one service endpoint to another. So we have a lot of keywords added up in this statement. So in general, we need to go back to the um, the history of um, or the de basic definition of what is a what is what is all about a service. So when we say service-oriented uh, architecture or service-oriented service applications which adhere to the service SOA paradigm, uh, we are talking about the applications that can talk to other applications on the, uh, on the network. Uh, in, in other words, earlier we ha used to have a DCOM, uh, which is a distributed component object model. And also we have in the .NET called remoting, .NET remoting, which can actually talk to other processes uh, uh, within the same machine across the process area as well as across the network or uh, across the machines so or machine to machine communication that can happen which is not completely new so uh, what WCF is a platform which you can actually leverage to build such applications which can talk to each other and the applications or the systems can be heterogeneous so there are a couple of standards established in the industry is called WS standards, uh, otherwise termed as uh, web service standards, uh, and there is an authoring body which governs the uh, WS standards so that uh, whichever applications uh, out there, the technologies available for internet communications or communication over the internet wire, um, so that the common protocol or the transport can be shared and communicated between various different technologies that are available. That that includes your Java-based services or or .NET-based services or a couple of more. There are a ton of others. It's, it's just a platform or um, the web service is a standard, just like uh, your COM as a standard or HTTP as a protocol. You have a couple of uh, stand, uh, standards or versions that all other browsers need to adhere to it. So it's, these are standards that people need to adhere to it. And so WCF uh, is a platform or a framework that is a, that is recent uh, development, not exactly recent, but in um, it's there uh, since uh, Rotten Framework 3.0, um, and a couple of years it's been, and today we are in 4.0 framework, and the WCF has a very rich frame uh, set of tools available, which can uh, be leveraged to develop a service. Uh, that can adhere to all the WS standards available in the industry without much of a pain. So if at all you want to get to the each of each and every line of what this WS standard is all about, then it's going to take your ages for you to understand and digest and then write a service that can adhere to the given standards. So for you, of course, it's again a rapid world uh, wherein you want to build things uh, up front and meet, the, meet your aggressive deadlines. So WCF is the best bet to go. Um, so what is what all we have and how it's going to make uh, our life easy? And I, I have, personally, I have worked with WCF for some years. I did work with 3.0 framework and 3.5 and again 4.0. So there's a lot of changes happen and a lot of enhancements. Uh, earlier in the initial versions of the WCF, it, is, it used to be like a nightmare for you to write a WCF code. Of course, writing a WCF code is a it's not a, that complicated. You can still do it uh, because it's the same C-sharp code, 
there's no new language that you need to really learn. It's the same .NET code, but only thing you need to know is the attributes. As long as you know the attributes, you're good. You can write a code and finish it off. But the biggest hurdle with the, with the, with the services is the configuration. So understanding the endpoint, what is an endpoint, understanding what is a binding, what they do, and for a given situation, what, what is best to use, and things like that, which is the transport you want to choose. All that is going to be a very big uh, uh, learning curve because it's a lot of information that you need to digest. We're not, we're not going to go that far today. So what uh, in 4.0 the biggest advantage is that you don't really have to worry about all the configuration. If you don't specify any configuration by default it's going to consume uh, based on the transport on which you hosted it. For example if you host on TCP IP it's going to by default consume the net TCP IP bindings if you host on the HTTP, the default is a basic HTTP bindings. Okay, so that's why it's going to consume it unless until you want to customize it to a given uh, transport or a given endpoint bindings, uh, you don't really have to worry about the configuration in the 4.0 side. Okay, good. So that's a little bit of overview of what is WCF. So WCF is just a framework uh, that can help you to build web services with ease. Uh, before we get into the WC features, uh, the industry out there usually ask you a very common question. So tell me about what you know about the web methods and uh, how different the web services are or WCF is. Um, to take a quick jump into what is a web method, how does it really look like, I will go back to my application here. So using your ASP.NET projects, you can also actually create just a minute. Yeah, within this project, I can go ahead and add a new item. Web service, yeah, there you go. So this is a web service that's available, which is uh, of extension ASMX. This is what the web methods, uh, the older version, or it's it's not again an older version, but it, this is what the first version was launched as part of 2.0. Um, and uh, 3.0 onwards, we have the WCF, which is a completely a new thing. And in this case, if I just add this, this is your service, and this service, if you see the attributes defined here, so this is what the one of the major difference you see. The attribute is a web service that you're going to decorate with, and there's a namespace. Of course, there's a de default uh, temp URI, and of course, web service bindings is given here, and the web methods, each of the member within the web methods. So it's this is a, a web methods which people you normally refer to. Okay, so what's the limitations with this web methods is that it sits within your uh, project, that's number one, uh, and also if you want to if host it, you can host it only on the HTTP uh, protocol, and uh, you cannot actually host this on TCP IP protocol, and of course there's a transport limitation on where you can host this, that's number one. Another two, uh, and major difference is that uh, w, web, web methods doesn't support all the data types that the normally you would like to. There is a limited set of uh, uh, data types that this can support and also there's a limited set of bindings that this, this can support and then it's a limited set of transport where this can be used. And that, those are the major differences with the WCF. In general again, the attributes is one of the cosmetic difference that you see. It's a web method is one of the them uh, for operations. Uh, in uh, at the service side, it's a web service, and of course, web service binding. So those are the basic uh, attribute differences that we normally see. Okay, so that's the little bit of overview on uh, the web methods in the ASP.NET, which is still there. Uh, and again, there are options when you would go with that, and when would you go with the WCF, okay? And if at all you're looking for a very rich, robust uh, code or 
application uh, service that you can actually have the flexibility of hosting on multiple transports which is which can be a HTTP or TCP IP or again a couple of other transports available which WCF supports which we're going to see in a couple of slides from now and it has a very rich feature and it's a very flexible it has a very rich set of data types that it can support and it is completely compliant with a lot of WS standards which includes the security uh, and also the en uh, the encodings uh, that it has a rich set of encodings and what are they we'll we'll see down the line okay so the WCF enables you to create uh, service oriented applications uh, that we did we did talk about and the SOA as an architecture is a, a very good one which makes the applications loosely coupled from each other. That's one of the ba major advantage with the SOA architecture. And applications, if you want to design an SOA model applications, then the best bet is WCF with us with the .NET code. Okay, there are other um, in the market. Uh, using Java web methods. Java also you call it as a web methods but uh, usually don't get confused with the ASP.NET web methods which is a legacy web services um, and versus the Java based web methods. So Java also have a web methods and I have seen people working with Java based web services and if you ask them then they'll tell you what kind of uh, nut and bolts they have to play with to make the Java service work. It's really a nightmare I would say and if at all you change any contract then you actually have to uh, do a lot of changes uh, in order to make that service really work for you. And when you come to Microsoft, it's a piece of cake. It's a very easy to deploy, very easy to write a code, and that's the reason it's a little luxury. But again, industry out there still don't like the way they Microsoft render the code at the end. They still see there is a lot of glitter between the uh, if you see the whistle. So it's a lot of arguments outside the world. We don't want to get into that uh, right now. We will get into the concept now. Okay, so the SOA architecture. Uh, the major benefit it gives you is that it's loosely coupled architecture where the applications can sit any way they want in the internet and still they can talk to each other, exchange information between them. That's the basic thing is exchange of information between two applications in the internet. Uh, ideally as a web service when you talk about and also you can have a Windows based services that too which again sits on your machine which is in the client machine. Okay, so in general, the term as a service, service can be a web service or a Windows based service. That's a key distinction you need to make. And you can develop both using WCF. Okay, and that's about the SOA architecture. And um, they are loosely coupled. That's a couple of advantages. And the next one oops, is the interoperability. Uh, so WCF is built to interoperate with web services that support a set of specifications known as a web service specification, so which we just started with. And a couple of these uh, web service specifications or web service standards, a couple of them are listed here. Is a SOAP message security, which is 1.0, and also we have 1.1. There are versions of the same uh, protocol that we got, or not protocol, it's a standards and username token and security groups token and things like that. So a bunch of uh, standards that you want to refer to. But again, as I mentioned, do you really want to go and refer all these to write a service? You don't have to in general, but it's good to know. But it's, uh, it's a big thing of its own, but if at all you want to be an expert in WCF and know more, then you can get into those. It's, information is uh, available on the internet. If you Google and see what is the web service standards or specification, WSS, you will see a lot of articles, or white papers on the internet. You can browse them. Okay, and this is the data contracts. Uh, the, one of the other features is the data contracts so because WCF is uh, uh, built using the .NET framework. It also includes the code friendly methods for uh, supplying the contracts. So you say, as I said, it's going to be completely a C-sharp code or VB.NET code, any .NET code using which you can write a WCF data contracts. And the data contract represents the information that is meant for exchange between the two endpoints. And uh, once you create the classes, you can actually use them and automatically generate the metadata, which is uh, what the metadata is the information that's going to be used for exchange between the both the endpoints. And we will see uh, the one version of the metadata is your WSDL, 
uh, we will see in uh, when we do this uh, service and uh, you see how the WSDL looks like and uh, how we can make use of it. So that's about the data contracts is one of the feature with WCF which is completely with the C sharp code. And the other one is the multiple message patterns. So there are a couple of three patterns which is imp are important when we talk about the services. So number one is the request and reply pattern, uh, which is a very common one, which applies to your client server model and also your internet based uh, service re request and response cycle, which is a request and reply. So that's one of the messaging pattern. And the other one is the one way pattern. So one way pattern is only one way communication. You always just uh, ping from uh, from the client to server and the server doesn't uh, bother to respond to you or the client also will not wait uh, to listen something from us. It's just from one way feed going from the, to the other end. And the other one is a duplex one. A duplex exchange can happen simultaneously from both the ends. So um, one message can be uh, transferring from one end to the other uh, from the client to server and the server is also trying to send the message from the other end also. So both the exchange, exchange can happen simultaneously. So that becomes a duplex exchange. So if using WCF, you can actually do all of these different uh, message patterns. And in a typical example of a duplex exchange is our instant messaging program, which can be written on uh, a client machine and the client can talk using a duplex exchange or uh, any kind of chatting uh, application. If you say look at, uh, it normally make use of the duplex exchange where the information exchange happens uh, both ways at the same time. Okay, and uh, that's about the multiple messages that's supported in WCF in a service metadata. WCF supports publishing service metadata, which is uh, of WSDL or XML schema or WS policy. And of course, the WS policy is again refers to the web service standards, uh, which again talks about how the metadata should look like. So that why again this WS standards? For example, if you want to consume a service written in dot .NET language, uh, if you want to consume that service in a program uh, developed in Java, how can you do that? Because it's uh, completely two different languages, two different technologies talking to each other. That's the whole purpose of having a service in place uh, to be start with, to start with, right? And that exchange need to be uh, communicated. So you need to have a common channel or common language in which both can talk to each other. Okay, so that's the basic thing. That's when the policy or the standards, of, uh, uh, web service standards comes into play. So that, uh, and WCF does adhere to all those standards and you don't really have to worry about them. You don't have to refer to hundreds of pages of books to really digest that and write a program. But of course, if you really do that, you can write a service with, uh, with your own technology that you can bring in to the industry. So it's the same concept that goes revolves back to your own .NET language. If you know the right, if you know how to write the compiler, you can uh, write your own .NET language. So it's the same thing goes around here. You don't have to use the .NET platform to build the services if you really know all these WS standards. As simple as that. Okay, so we don't want to go that route. So we want to be simplified in our life. So that's why we rely on tools and technologies that are available. Right. And the metadata can be published over HTTP or HTTPS or using the web service metadata exchange, which is MEX, is another word short form is called metadata exchange that can be used for publishing the metadata, which is a very key information for the client to consume it. Without this metadata information, the client will not will have no idea about what to call and what to pass. So metadata is important. And the next one is the WCF features is the multiple transport and codes. So this is a very key piece of information. You want to either note it down in a paper or put it in your memory. Um, this is a very fundamental thing people do ask what kind of encoding uh, WCF supports and what kind of transport protocol does it support. It supports, it supports all these. Uh, the encoding it supports basically three. The one is the text uh, encoding. Uh, which can support both the XML encoding or plain XML encoding. In other words, it's referred to as POX, uh, uh, plain old XML. That's the encoding that people normally refer to, POX or uh, SOAP encoding. SOAP is again a very common protocol that you can make use of it for information encoding. 
that's a simple object access protocol and the binary encoding you can make use of it uh, that's supported in WCF which can be very uh, useful uh, Within uh, it depends again. Okay, it will be very compact and binary format, and this is again not interoperable. That means uh, if you choose to go with binary compatibility, then that kind of a service cannot be consumed by other uh, technologies. That's what it means to say by in, uh, it's uh, interoperable. Uh, so the Java program can never understand this word binary format you're talking about. So it, it is this is purely uh, cases wherein. Uh, you want to develop a Windows based services using WCF wherein it's going to be processed or uh, exchanged between applications within your own Windows operating system or within your LAN or WAN. And MTOM is another uh, encoding supported which is uh, uh, stands for the message transmission optimization mechanism and MTOM is a very useful one in cases where you have a large set of uh, data that you want to transfer and you want to make it a reliable connection between both the ends and also this is also a, a binary based and uh, this if you make it this is again not going to be uh, interoperable uh, again mtom is uh, again if you if you if the other client is also a dotnet platform and it's another service that's going to consume it and which is good to go with the mtom uh, binding uh, but if you want to make your uh, service interoperable that means uh, any other cross platforms or cross technologies can consume it then the only option you have is the text which is going to be plain XML or SOAP based and also now the transport layers we were talking about the HTTP is the one which is going to be supported by default uh, and for that you need to host uh, your service on the IIS uh, for, to support the HTTP uh, transport layer or protocol and this is uh, HTTP is a non-connection based what it means is that the the request that comes in from the client side uh, it, it again so HTTP itself is stateless in other words we do the internet completely with the HTTP the information is sent from the client to the server and it's a stateless what stateless means is that once the request uh, goes to the server the request is uh, is going to be there in the server only till its life cycle. Once the life cycle is done and the response is uh, out from the server, server will not have any clue what this uh, request is all about and what this response is all about. So the request and response itself is going to be stateless because that means the state is not maintained either at the client side or at the server side. That's the reason we need to actually temporarily have some kind of mechanism to hold this information uh, between the exchange for which we have a view state or a session state or a application state um, and so, the, so that's the reason we have this state mechanism, state management also. So HTTP is a stateless and that means it's a non-connection based and TCP you know, the, on the other hand is a transmission control protocol which can be used uh, on the same machine or in the, within your network. That means the TCP is completely on a given server which can be exposed using a port number. And of course you need to open the respective port for your uh, service to listen to and uh, have your communication established. And this is a connection based as I been saying. Um, it's a port based and it's a connection based and the port need to be opened for TCP IP to work. And this is the option you will go with if you decide to host your uh, service for intranet use or uh, for within the LAN use or various uh, uh, enterprise applications within the enterprise want to exchange information uh, between applications uh, it's not going to be exposed to outside world that means internet then the TCP is the best bet and it's very fast and it's very reliable because it's within the same network and also, also the, you don't really have to worry about the security also from the external threats. Of course, within the enterprise applications, if you want to enforce security, you can still do that. And of course, HTTP is option when you want to expose your service to the outside world. Uh, of course, it can be on intranet applications also. It could be between LAN to LAN within the same organization. That's fine. And also to the outside of World Wide Web. Okay, and the named pipes is another transport which WCF supports, which is a kernel-based uh, transport, so, uh, which is, of course, it's as the name implies, it has a pipe 
with the name. So each of the, that's the kernel based how the queuing is going to happen and using which it can support both the one way and also duplex communication between processors on a single machine. Okay, and the last one is the MSM queue. This stands for the Microsoft Messaging Queue. MSMQ is again not a new thing. It's uh, been there for quite some time, but only thing in the recent time it's not been that recommended to use because it has a lot of limitations. Uh, it's the messaging queue within an enterprise you can actually uh, make use of it wherein, uh, the, for example, if you want to do any offline activities, uh, and but still the, the clients can still uh, submit their request and the server can uh, keep on queuing all those uh, requests in a queue, which is called MSM queue, and all the requests can sit in the queue and the server can process them whenever it is available. So that kind of a model, if you want to bring in, MSM queue is the best uh, uh, to go. And uh, those are all the transports uh, supported using a WCF and the encoding. So a lot of information and very good information. People do normally ask, uh, uh, this set of what are the encodings the WCF support, uh, that's a common question people do ask and what are the transports it, does it support, it's a common question that people do ask and it's important to know. And the next one is the transactions. So using WCF, if you know the transactions, we have been talking about transactions and especially the distributed transactions is a very key thing which you can do the uh, database interactions uh, as atomicity. If you know the database uh, language, atom is one of the thing, stands for the atomicity of a given transaction. So WS atomic transaction is the, again, WS standard, uh, which talks about the transactions over the service calls. So service calls can go anywhere on the internet, but still you can maintain a transaction between two calls. For example, uh, the first call is going and creating a record in address table, and the second call is going and creating a record in a department table. And address table is in uh, Oracle, and the department table is in SQL Server on a two different uh, locations. And of course, this can uh, very rarely can happen, but I'm just giving an example. So we are talking about the transaction of a service which can hit two different calls to two different locations, but still maintain a transaction. So that if one call fails, the other one can be rolled back. So that's what uh, the WS Atomic Transaction talks about. And if, of course, you can implement the transactions using the APIs, uh, which we use, called the system.transactions in our BWC. Uh, yes, BWL business workflow layer wherein we use the system.transaction namespace and the transaction scope class to implement the transaction in the application side and that you can also make use of that uh, within the WCF service and also the last one is the Microsoft distributed transaction coordinator. You can make use of that as well. So WCF has a very rich uh, features uh, with respect to, oops, I'm messing up here. Yeah, and the Ajax and REST support, and this is the uh, hot today. Uh, REST transfer representational state transfer. This is a concept which is again, uh, as I've been saying, right? So if you know the WS specifications and know the technology, how the internet works, you don't have to come to WCF. That's what REST is. So REST is a, a way to implement the W uh, web services. Uh, plainly pure, using the pure uh, text-based, plain XML or SOAP-based envelopes uh, that the internet works with. You don't have to really write uh, uh, very, uh, very strong uh, wrappers or frameworks to make real things work. And of course, that's one of the reasons uh, why people down the line, uh, other people, the other side of the uh, coin, doesn't like uh, the way the Microsoft does because it has a lot of heavy implementations, uh, the way it renders the WSDL, it's not clean enough because if I write something my own, then I can write much more clean WSDL or things like that. You know, people do argue. So the rest is one of the good thing that's coming into the place where it uh, doesn't uh, go with the same pattern in which the SOAP envelope really works. WCF, again, WCF can be configured to process plain XML data that is uh, that is not a wrapped in SOAP envelope. Normally, if you people do ask, uh, how does a SOAP looks like? Uh, SOAP protocol, if you look like, it does have a pretty much uh, sections. The first one is the envelope. 
that's a higher root. Within the envelope, you have a header, and then you have a content, which is a body, and a couple of more probably. But those are the that's the basic structure of SOAP envelope looks like. And uh, of course, the rest is completely open, so you can even uh, don't have such kind of uh, restriction. You can now also do a plain XML data or plain text format. In this case, a JSON is another one format, a uh, non-XML format. In other words, the JSON is a JavaScript object notation, which is again a popular. So things are making little simple instead of going with a very strong or very rich set of uh, uh, schemas and definition other things. So REST is all about uh, making it things simple and WCF can also process REST based services as well. So it has a support for that too. Okay, so that's all goes uh, with the web 2.0 technology. If you have a time or interest, you can always browse it and see what the w web 2.0 technology talks about and what the rest, rest is all about. It gives a lot of good information and uh, using WCF, you can do a lot of things. And now comes into the keywords which are necessary for us to know when we talk about WCF. The first thing is the message. Of course, this is a basic term that we normally use, the message exchange between two endpoints, and the, it's a self-contained unit of data that can consist of several parts, including the body and headers. In other words, the SOAP is the best example that we just talked about, which has a header, which has a body with the content, and it has a, uh, information of its own. A message is simply a message that can be exchanged between two different endpoints, in other words. And the service, that's a basic thing we've been talking about and it's a construct that exposes one or more endpoints with each endpoint exposing one or more service operations. And how does it look like? We will see how the contract uh, looks like soon after we cover up these basic keywords. And the service in general, if someone asks what is a service, then a service is a service is an a, a upper set where within which it can have multiple uh, endpoints. Uh, it can actually encapsulate multiple endpoints within a service and each of the endpoints can have multiple operations. In older terms, it's a web method we're talking about. And WCF keywords, again, the endpoint. So just we just talked about what is an endpoint. So endpoint uh, is the construct at which messages are sent or received. It's like a station. Uh, at the client side, client station and the server station. So it's an endpoint. So one end to another end. So that's the basic thing is the information exchange from one endpoint to another endpoint. So that's it. And it comprises of the location. There is an address, of course, when you talk about the uh, endpoint, it's the address is important. An address in the uh, WCF terms, if it is hosted on HTTP, it's going to be like a URI. And we're going to see what is an address again down the line. And it defines the message that can be sent and a, spec a specification of the communication mechanism. So how are you going to communicate between these two endpoints? We did see couple of options available as a transport layer or the encoding mechanisms that we talked about. So the endpoint do have the information about the address of the endpoint, that means the location where you need to send or receive the data from, and also by which means we're going to communicate this message transmission. That's called the binding information. Okay, that binding information will talk about the transport that you're going to use, what kind of encoding mechanism you're going to use, and a couple of more information. And uh, also, it has, of course, the, the definition for a set of messages that can be sent or received or both at the location. And, of course, the service contract. So, service contract describes the, uh, describes the what a message can be sent. So, we'll see how the service contract looks like down the line. And AWCF service uh, is exposed to the world as a collection of endpoints. So that's the base thing. So the service itself is exposed to the, end uh, the outside world as an endpoint. So if you ask someone to consume a given service, so what you need to know first thing is the endpoint. So endpoint itself contains the information of the location, that means the address of the service, and also the binding information which talks about what kind of, uh, which mechanism you're going to use to communicate. Either it's a TCP IP or it's a HTTP or HTTPS or uh, uh, name pipes or MSMQ, so on. So you have, you have these, all these uh, transports available, so which mechanism you're going to 
choose to communicate to that given address. And of course, you have the address, you have the uh, you have the mechanism, but what you're going to call that that talks about your service contract. So contract will have the operation that you're going to be using to make a call. Okay. So those are the three things. Information will go into the endpoint. And the address. Now we just we talked about the address. So what the address looks like? It's just a URI, which is a uniform uh, resource, resource locator. Uh, we're going to uh, see that when we do the demo. Okay. I don't want to again jump to different things. Okay. Oops. I'm messing up here. Sorry. Address, and then comes the binding. So this is what we've been talking about as part of the endpoint. So the binding will define how an endpoint communicates to the world and it is constructed of this set of components called the binding elements. And that stack stack one on top of the other. So this is the configuration that how it looks like uh, in the web service side. Uh, the base uh, root of your section, in other words, the section is system not service model that stands for your service side and it has a binding section within it and this is where the basic HTTP binding is uh, configured in this example and within the basic HTTP exam we have a binding you can have set of bindings configured here in this case uh, we have a my binding config and we can associate a given endpoint to use the given binding information Okay, in 4.0 you don't have to do any of these. If you just host it on a uh, HTTP then or your IIS, it's going to actually make use of the default basic HTTP bindings. Unless you really specify uh, which one you want to use or customize it to the way you want it. For example, in this case, the max buffer size or max receive buffer size, uh, if you want to change this, uh, there is always, always a default value. You can also go to the MSD and see the default uh, basic HTTP binding or what are the default settings it looks like. And uh, if you want to take a look at it, and you can take a look at it. Um, and I, I'm going to show you one of the uh, real world example as well. I'll just walk you through the uh, configuration, how it looks like. How can you customize that uh, down the line? And this is how the binding configuration looks like. And this has the information about the uh, the transfer that you're going to use and how you're going to communicate. Okay. And uh, this, um, of course, once you see the example, you might have uh, more understanding. And the behavior configuration. And the behaviors is again a part of the configuration. The component that can uh, is the component uh, within the service model configuration, which controls the various runtime aspects of the service. Uh, an endpoint and a particular operations or, or a client. So it, it can have a couple of uh, notations like this within this example. We have a service metadata, HTTP get enabled is true, which will uh, do the get uh, uh, part of the HTTP request. And it is enabled true and you can actually uh, configure the behavior part of the configuration and uh, again in this case service debug include exception the detail in false that's one of the things so for it all uh, in a debug mode you want to have the exception details sent across uh, then you can enable that so everything you can configure so again just like your enterprise library WCF is also completely uh, configuration driven major part is configuration driven you can write the code simply it's a c-sharp code nothing to worry about it anyone can do that uh, who knows the language basics but the biggest hurdle with WCF is the right configuration that you need to apply at a given time um, so I have personally faced a lot of problems with respect to configuring the WCF services especially in cases where uh, you have um, concurrent calls that comes in like it's a heavily hit service you have a thresholds uh, in the service side you need to configure to achieve the maximum uh, throughput of your service so that uh, n number of concurrent hits to the service uh, service can handle uh, n number of concurrent hits at this given time so they we have to really massage or tweak it in the right way so everything is a configuration driven Good. So message contract. Now we enter into the concepts and uh, this which is really what you see as a programmer down the line and in the code. So message contract is the first thing. There are a couple of set of contracts and again I think I need to tell you what is a contract again. In general if you take a look at the contract definition, it's a um, it's a terms or conditions that are agreed between 
two parties. In other words, we are talking about uh, information exchange between two endpoints, and of course, both need to rely or rely on a common word that this is a contract that I am going to provide you, and you are going to consume it. That's the trading. Uh, in other words, an agreement between both the parties. In general, that's what the contract is. Uh, and the same th same concept applies with the WCF as well, because the service that uh, one one of the endpoint is offering a service, the other endpoint is actually consuming a service. So the contract uh, will be uh, need to met by the publisher and the consumer, so that both information exchange can happen uh, smoothly uh, and as expected. So the contract, and we have various types of contracts, and one of the first thing is the message contract. So the message contract, you can make use of this if you want to really have a customized SOAP message. We did talk about how the SOAP looks like, right? And in this example, we can see that. And if you decorate a class with the message contract in this case, and it can have a message header and a message body member. And with using this information, you can actually expose your C# -sharp class uh, just like a SOAP message in your call. So what you're building here is a customized SOAP message uh, that you want to build uh, to communicate for the uh, with the next party, or the opponent party. In this case, SOAP is a general uh, uh, exchange uh, encoding that you can that can be consumed by any other. Uh, technology outside the world, including the Java or anyone else. So in which case, uh, if the other system is relying on a given SOAP message, then you can actually customize it and build it the way you want it, in which case you can go with the uh, message contract. Okay? And the service contract, this is again fundamental thing. So service contract, uh, it ties together multiple related operations into a single functional unit. So that's what we did talk about a service. Service itself at the high end, it encapsulates multiple other endpoints and within the endpoints you can have multiple service operations or service contracts. In this case, a service contract comes into play. Within a service contract, I can have n number of operation contracts. Okay? You can imagine the service contract just like your BWL or uh, your data access layer or data access component within which you have a multiple other operation contract which is a create, update, delete and so on. Okay? And usually the service contract usually goes with an interface implementation uh, otherwise uh, you can still actually do that uh, without uh, an interface you can do it but it's a good practice to go with. You can actually try that. Um, I did try, so why, it's, why it needs to be an interface always, okay? You can, why can't I have a service contract on just a, a plain class? Why I can't have it? You can still have it, you can try it out. The, again, so with respect to the keyword contract and interface, they mutually match with the same keyword. If you see, interface again, it talks about a contract. It has a signature, predefined set of signature, and doesn't have an implementation body with it. So whoever want to implement it, then they can implement the service behavior. So service behavior is the next part, uh, which we'll talk about uh, probably, it's not in the right order, but yeah, here we, we talk about the data contract. So the data contract is again a, a formal agreement between a service and the client that abs um, abstractly describes the data to be exchanged. So it's the data information exchange between two endpoints. Uh, and the data contract will have the right information that's agreed between both the parties. And in not in the code wise, you decorate the uh, respective one, respective class with the data contract. It can be just plain uh, class in our case, employer address, and have decorated that with the data contract. And of course, it has a data member within it. And you can still have any other members which you don't want to expose to the end party, then you simply you can get rid of this data member contract. You can still have that property, but if you don't decorate with the data member contract uh, attribute, then it's not going to be exposed to the outside. So what happens internally with the .NET is these are these are default serializations that are available. That is data contract serialization. What ideally happens when this is going to be rendered to the uh, in the communication channel? It's going to 
serialize your class information into the respective transport and coding information. In the, if you're using the plain text-based uh, message encoding, then you and choosing for SOAP protocol, then again you can it will be transformed into the SOAP binding, SOAP protocol, and it is going to be enveloped within the SOAP and then send it across. That's the kind of a serialization happens. And the fault contract, this is a kind of contract which you can actually make use of it for exception handling at the service side. This is a very general uh, people ask, how will you handle exception in service side? So something happens, something breaks uh, in the service side and how will you uh, inform the client that such an exception happened? So that is using by fault exceptions or fault contracts. Uh, in other words, you can call it as a fault, uh, here you go. So in this case, this is a fault contract wherein uh, this operation, of course this is an operation contract and what this specifies is that this operation is going to return this fault contract and this fault contract is again type of a math fault which is nothing but it's just another data contract, okay. So this is a data contract within which has, it has a data member and uh, which is operation and, oper and the problem type so on. So you can actually have uh, break it into the same key and value pair wherein uh, error and um, so error ID and error code or whatever error code and the error description. So likewise you can have a contract and also in our case we have a collection of errors that you are sending out right. In that case you can also make this as a collection and uh, written it out so that you can do it so that the recipient will have the collection of uh, key value pairs likewise. So that's about fault contract and th that brings the end to my um, slide and okay now we'll quickly jump into the code and I actually to save our time I did actually uh, done with the code which is ready for you to demo okay okay no for now Looks like the, I'm not sure where this uh, configuration got modified from external side. Okay, fine. So this is the service that I've created. So the beauty of the model that we have here is that we are actually making use of the same library that we have built so far, which is BWL, DAL, DOM, helper and everything. And only new thing here is the WCF service. So that's the reason, that's one of the advantage of having this multi-layered architecture and in this case in the other solution if I take a look at this is a web project so if you take a look at the project here so in this case what we have here is a web project as a user interface okay this is a web project as a user interface and in this case it's a web service as a front end user interface so now the user interface can be two different things but if I make my components reusable the way I we have right now, which is a BWL, DAL, DOM, so on. So I can reuse them and uh, plug into any other interface that we're looking for. In this case, we can also write a uh, ASP.NET MVC, uh, which has its own uh, view. Within the controller, I can make use of my BWL layer. So that's what exactly I did for WCF service. And again, how to create a WCF service, it's very simple. I can actually show that out of box what are you going to get? Out of box if I say new project and I here I have two things of course four things we will not go with the other two things uh, the first thing is the WCF cloud service library okay where it you can actually create a library but cannot be hosted for hosting you need to have a WCF service application so in this case I'll just pick the WCF service application okay I'm going to pick this into Item just to keep it outside whatever I'm doing and I just create this application and outside this um, template I have a couple of things added up here okay if you take a look at this I have a service contract created and also the SVC file which is your startup file for your service SVC is a startup file and also it has a web.country. It's pretty simple and just like a web application. This is nothing but it's a web application. If I take a properties and see it has a web properties, that means it's just a web application. And only thing here is I have a service 
uh, of course it has a designer or it doesn't have a designer of course and it has a code behind of course by default if I hit on this I get the code behind and within the code behind I have this service behavior implementation but of course the service behavior is actually implementing the respective service contract which is I service one this is a sample code that's available out of the template and within this service uh, I can see the service contract attribute which which is the main attribute and the operation contract and in this case I have a composite type as well and this is a plain normal string which is returning which looks like just like a, any standard function or a method and uh, within this operation contract I have a composite type which I go to definition I see the data contract also and the data contract is again very simple it's plain just a class only thing this attributes are decorated with the data contract and the data member in ideally in the real world applications what additionally you will uh, tend to see here is the namespace okay okay so uh, what I'm trying to come to here is the namespace is one of the key attributes that you want to specify because that's what uh, will always reflect your uh, uniqueness of your code and uh, you need to have that namespace uh, ideally otherwise by default it is temp uh, temp URI that's going to be generated out okay so out of box if I just try to run this code you will have this beautiful WCF test client which is ready out of box you don't have to write a client to test your service uh, in earlier we used to have to write a client to test it uh, and now we have a beautiful GUI based uh, a test client it's in uh, 4.0 and you can actually simply run this code here itself I can say 500 and hit invoke and of course this is a warning which is good and the response is out here so this tool has the request part and the response part and I, it gives me the value from the service side that's the out of box uh, uh, template that's going to give you and you just have to modify things but again, as a as a person, I always go back to rely on some of the best practices so that I can make re reusability is always a big thing I want to always consider. So I will get rid of this. So what I did instead is, of course, the same web project I have, but in this case, I got rid of the, the code behind. What I did here is, of course, this is going to be my entry point. So what I did here is this service pointing to another library or the behavior which is actually uh, having the service implementation in this case it's actually going mapping back to my service library and my service library will have all my functionality so what this is going to give me is this is going to be my C sharp library okay this is just a class library as we see and this is my WCF service library so this is the first option that we see when we create a new project that's the option I pick to create this one and within this I have everything so this web project is just an application to host my service and nothing else so in this case I'm hosting on a web project that means the implicitly it's going to take a basic HTTP uh, bindings and the surprisingly if you take a look at the web.config of course I should have uh, showed you the other one which is almost empty it doesn't have anything in this case I have to add all the required configuration because my BWL is actually making use of all my validation configuration also database configuration everything else so I have to bring in all the configuration here and remember one thing uh, the configuration part so since I have my library uh, used inside this uh, the application is going to always look into the configuration of the host application okay in the other in the other case where in this case we have this web.config which is specific to my web application so this is my hosting application wherein this uh, the execution starts from here that's why it always looks into the web.config within that and of course it may, you need to have all your configuration applicable to your application and similarly here since my hosting application is a different web project but it is going to be hosting a service uh, so I still have to have the same configuration here because it's two different applications but so the same configuration in other words so what important what is important here is the service model configuration so this is what important for me in the service 
and if you see it's a very very simple uh, it doesn't have uh, any uh, service endpoint configuration nothing else you don't see anything here if I take a look uh, walk uh, to one of the production like service configuration it's going to look like this this is one of the production uh, configuration that I'm trying to open let me see this is the service model and we have some extensions and diagnostics let's not worry about that so this is a service uh, configuration that usually you need to specify within which the binding configuration goes and the behavior is what configured here and in this configuration we have the custom binding within bindings we uh, internally it's going to make use of the uh, basic HTTP binding uh, in other words it's a HTTPS and it's a custom binding which is actually making use of the uh, SOAP 1.1 version that's the reason it's actually customized and a couple of more you can actually customize it here like the uh, max adapt in other words the message uh, max message that you're going to see in which SOAP version we're going to make use of it because this service is intended to consume by uh, the Java based clients in which uh, they support only SOAP 1.1 uh, whereas by default uh, .NET supports 1.2 so uh, so portion that's the reason we need to actually make it a customized binding to accommodate that okay so this is how the real uh, web service uh, looks like configuration looks like in uh, this is actually from 3.5 and we are looking at the configuration at 4.0 where none of that really appears it's just a behavior which of course it takes default values and you don't see any service configuration or endpoint configurations, right? How does an endpoint configuration look like? It should be, endpoint should be here somewhere else. And of course, yeah, here we go. I missed it, this part. The endpoint is here within the service and it has an address as we talked about. And right now this is, uh, of course, it's a HTTP address and it has a behavior configuration and also the binding configuration. In this case, the binding configuration is a custom binding, which is, of course, the it's uh, it says custom binding and the binding configuration name, which is a HTTP binding. And also, the it will route always back to the binding section and look for the respective bi custom binding. Uh, within the custom binding, it will look for the respective binding name that's how it's going to be configured okay so that's the namespace again the rest all the information the contact information a lot of information need to be configured for your service to work in the previous versions and uh, with uh, 4.0 none of that you need to specify good so what else we did here okay so it's a plain simple uh, service we saw how the SVC is hooked up to the respective service behavior implementation and it's actually traversing all the way back to this library and this library is of course referred into this project of course I have a lot of other references but because I it need to have all the references that uh, your web project has because your BWL is making use of all of them and this is the reference we had for the WCF service library okay and it's going to make use of that reference and it's going to load the given assembly and what it's going to load here is we have these three parts one is the service contract the first one in which I have I employee service and within this I have the get employee create new employee and update employee and what I'm doing within this I'm actually having another uh, data contract here within this I have it of course I'll walk from here itself employee as a data contract so this is uh, actually a data contract okay so as we see we have a data members within uh, each of these and did I specify the data contract attribute I did not yep. good so this is what I'm missing here Okay, I added that up, so that need to be there, uh, and also the uh, data members, uh, all are part of this. And also similarly, I have another data contract. Of course, within my employee, I also have an address. So it's a nested complex type or, or composite type, wherein I have an address here, which is also defined as a data contract here. 
The key thing is it's the same class uh, I just um, moved from the DOM except that it doesn't have any other annotations for validations or validation implementation, nothing is there. It's just a plain uh, class which takes those attributes, that's it. And similarly for the employee, I don't have any other code other than the attributes, which is the data members. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this as a contract to the client and ask them to pass this information into our service. And the rest of the action will be taken in the service behavior because this is the entry point from your service side. If you remember, if you take a look at this, where is my SVC file? Okay, so SVC is actually going to come into HR project, AWCF service library and employee service. And that's actually the implementation of my service behavior, which is my employee service, which is this. So this will be the behavior part it's going to look for. It's not the contract. Okay, it's the behavior where exactly the code is implemented. And in this case, I have this code implementation for my I employee service, wherein I have get employee, create new employee, update employee. So what I need to do is I just have to make use of the BWL layer to make my things work. But to make that work, since BWL takes a domain object model, which is employee, and I am getting a data contract of employee, I need to actually do some conversion here. That's what I, I did some of the conversion uh, functions here, which will convert a, a given a data contract address to a DOM. If I get a DOM address in this conversion, I convert the DOM to data contract and also similarly uh, data contract to DOM. That's the conversion logic I have written, which is again plain simple, uh, which takes the DOM and uh, create the data contract instance and populate that data and return it out. That's what the basic uh, transformation is happening here. Other than that, it's going to be plain simple and get employee, it does the same thing, create the instance of BWC layer, create the employee of DOM and do the conversion and make the retrieve, pass the DOM object to retrieve and again type cast that of course because that returns me the uh, HR domain base class, I am just transforming that again as since I have the DOM here uh, and I have to return a data contract, I am just transforming uh, the DOM to a data contract and uh, returning it out. So that's the implementation with my get employee because I'm making use of the same all other layers. And similarly with the create new employee, it's the same con conversion here, only thing I'm calling the create new in from the BWC, passing the DOM. And of course since I'm getting the data contract as my in parameter, I'm transforming that using my convert logic to convert the given data contract to a domain object model class. That's a simple code and it took uh, roughly an hour for me to uh, hour and hour and a half to write this uh, entire code and make it work. Uh, I just prepared it just uh, before I start this session. Uh, so imagine how fast you can write the service and make it ready because my all my BWL is ready. Now I'm going to run this and test it out. Uh, to test it, we want to see the WSDL first, right? So to see the WSDL, what I can do is instead of uh, a specific page, I will just say current page, which is nothing, right? Current page in this case, I hope I'm not selecting anything. In which case, I can see the directory listing or no, because they, I think it's the current is already pointed to this. I would, I would point out to this and then run. Probably this will help. There you go, yep, now I'm able to see. And this is the directory listing by default and within this I'm getting into the SVC and this is the service um, and it, if you see this is asking to create test client. This is how the old way um, we used, I used to do to create a test client which is going to be a console application and that you're going to host it uh, as a self-hosting way. You run that and uh, uh, use it in your as a client. In, uh, in today we have a beautiful tool and this is the WSDL we are talking about. And it does have the metadata information of the service that we are talking about and if you see this is the temp URI.org uh, that's a default uh, um, URL that's going to be published uh, unless you want to change it. If you want to change it, as I showed you at the contract level you need to specify the namespace.
yeah, that will take care of this and this has a respect to a contract information and also the all those uh, data contract information will be part of the WSTL okay and uh, what else so this should be taken care of. now I want to actually run this using the uh, respect to uh, test to client in which case I will go with the test client and I can invoke the members directly and apparently here uh, since uh, the way we have our database files uh, designed to have a local database file and this is not a central server we are hitting every time so I have to copy the respective uh, database into this uh, application because this copy is different from the web service copy so that's now the database are not same okay ideally in the real world you might be talking to the centralized SQL Server database in which case you don't have to really uh, bring these files in so in our case uh, if I the service talks to the common local database and in which case I will uh, go with the data that I have in the employee table here and will demonstrate it here in this case I'll say 109 I'm going to retrieve okay so that's the employee ID 109 and hit invoke uh, this is a warning let's see if it retrieves yes it retrieved the value for me so it retrieved the employee information from the database and brought back uh, the mailing address uh, the permanent address and also the employee information it's perfect so working good now again we can do the same thing with the create new employee we'll uh, do a quick uh, save and see if this runs good okay and uh, I will hit some test data. Department ID I will leave blank. Employee employee uh, uh, sorry email ID email ID I'll say test uh, this. See so remember we have our validations uh, at our domain object model level. So now if you if you have done only the client side validations and no no server side validation, then the client side validations will be inside your ASPX page, right? Since I have the server side validation in the DOM, I can actually leverage the same business rules in my WCF also. So I'm going to test that also here. I'm giving a wrong email ID here. And uh, name will be test99. And again test99. I'll say L. And what else? Mailing address here. I'll just pick the respective data type that it is supporting and I expand it. I'll see this and I'll see test 99 and city as uh, say my city state as my state and zip one five digit code and that's about the mailing address and permanent address also I will key in or for now I can leave this blank okay don't worry about too much of things and because since our validation doesn't ask for permanent um, address oops I need to pick the data type probably first and then hit the value here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so ten digit number and similarly for the six so this might be a little um, not that intuitive to work with, but of course you can write your own client or consume it within your application. That's that's that can be done. Okay, I just uh, fed all the values and I have a couple of invalid values. One of them is the email ID, and let's see if the business rules fire. There you go. I have the business rules fired, and it says um, how many errors. I just transformed those uh, key value pairs or a dictionary of values into string in this case uh, email id is invalid and also but not yeah there's one line address line one issue also probably this is part of my uh, please enter the address and there's something else actually address the first line this is our self validation which is firing up probably this is because uh, it's not for the mailing address is because of the permanent address but I, I think uh, I just left this null but I don't, I'm not sure why anyway I'll key in this this also and see if that is not the case 89 and city is uh, say test 89 the n and five digit one two three four five okay and I'll fix my email ID now 
test89 at 89.com perfect and invoke this okay zip is required so where did I miss the zip or oh, zip 5 I missed here perfect so it's running all the validations that is needed and of course permanent I think we are good with the permanent address and hit and now this time I don't have uh, any error so that means this time it should have saved my record into the database so I'll quickly go back and refresh my database will I see 111 yes I have successfully saved that into my database perfect so my service is working good and similarly I can do my update as well and uh, that's how we can actually create your service and uh, run it in your local and the last part is consuming the service. So consuming is a very very simple thing. Uh, what you can do is um, in this case I'll create uh, a new project which is going to be a Windows based application, Windows Forms. Okay, this is just a test client. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to keep my service running because this need, this need to be hosted first and before it's get consumed and in which case I will um, go with the other way around wherein I want to see the service URL that I want to consume good so this is the service uh, wisdom or the address that we're talking about now in this case the service is running now I'm going to go ahead and uh, consume go and add a service reference the second one and in this case the address we have picked here I'll just say go discover that and this is going to discover the service and give me the service contract information this is extracted from the visual that we have just published and now say okay this is just as simple as uh, consuming any DLL that we are referring to. In this case, what it's going to do is, it's going to add this service reference section within which the key file that you want to always refer to is the reference.cs. If you expand this, then you will see the contact information that you have uh, written and consumed within your all the phone field, sex field and all that information contact information is available here and within your uh, code if you want to consume it what you need to do here is um, it's could just have to consume the I'll add a button here sorry tools button come on button okay okay just on the button click what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make use of the import statement or using statement what is the service name we have referred to it's the service reference one let me check what is the namespace we have here oh this is with my applications okay good and the namespace here and once I add that I just have to create the instance of uh, the respective service reference. The respective is just the creating instance of the respective class and uh, creating instance of it. In this case, this is an employee class available. Create instance of that uh, and pass it as an uh, uh, input parameter to it. And then these are a couple of interfaces, but there should be a concrete one that we want to make use of it, uh, which is the employee service client. That's what we are trying to refer to. Uh, okay, so this is what we're going to use employee service client uh, is equal to new employee service client. So this is what the client instance you're going to create, and then uh, CS dot uh, you should be able to see the get employee call, and of course you will pass the employee ID. In this case, we have one zero nine. Uh, okay, one zero nine, and of course it it returns a uh, employee object employee e is equal to that's all it takes right and what else and uh, we are not going to make use of this is going to be e message box to show it's going to be e dot uh, we'll say first name okay just to keep our oops 
uh, simple anyway we are till this far and I'll add a breakpoint here and uh, and there is a value here error it cannot be declared oh because it's already events org there's another parameter with the same name that's why it's scribbing em I can make it it's scribbing because uh, there's already e declared with the parameter name that's why okay and I just run this and hit the service call do I have an output here and I can go ahead with the quick watch to see what we have as a response so we can see the whole data out from the service so we can see all the data so I hope that's clear that's that's easy to consume within your client and we have a chintan there so and so that's all about how we to consume within a client we did uh, and if you want to host it it's just like any web application that you want to host on a IIS server or a TCP based on the transfer that you want to if you want to host on TCP then you need to actually write a uh, service uh, uh, client for that which is a Windows service client and uh, then host your application the way we had just created uh, instance of the client and it's a little different way with the TCP IP otherwise uh, if it is on, a, on HTTP you can actually host it on an IIS web server so we just completed session 34 and in this session we did see a complete overview of a WCF and also we did see how can we uh, uh, create uh, uh, or satisfy our requirement to create an employee service uh, using WCF uh, I just walked through how easy it is and uh, to create a WCF service and uh, and also we did walk through the various configuration points uh, uh, related to the WCF and how can we deploy and consume the employee service uh, using WCF we did walk through and this uh, takes uh, close to the uh, end of our session and we have one more uh, session uh, 35 will uh, cover all the other ETL and database uh, reporting and other things uh, in the last session.